Hey, we're in a series called The Whole Story, and uh, for four weeks, three weeks, however long it takes, we're in, a, in the book of Job, so we're kind of making a mini-series within the series called Surviving the Struggles. Uh, surviving the Struggles, the idea is that, that many of you, you know what it's like. You, you love the Lord. You've given your life to Jesus. God is good. He's blessed you. He's been faithful. He's shown his faithfulness time and time again through trial after trial. He's shown himself faithfulness. But sometimes, in fact, I would be confident saying every single person here probably has or will, and maybe are currently in a season of life where the Lord is good, you love the Lord, but survival is all you've got. Survival is all you've got. Some seasons of life, you can't just magically do 10 steps to go from surviving to thriving. Sometimes for a season, survival's all you've got. And this series is about learning from Job's experience, lessons that Job wasn't capable of knowing yet. Job learned lessons on your behalf through his experience so you can survive the struggles with greater ease. Amen, family? Can we praise God for that family? Can we praise God for that family? Okay. Job has survived struggles to make surviving struggles less painful for you if you're willing to learn the lessons from him. What did we learn in week number one? Job didn't know this. He was learning it. Actually, Job never tells us in the book of Job that Job learned this lesson. But what did we learn from reading Job's story? Some, one of the best ways to survive the struggles well is to make sure you fight the right battles against the right enemies. That was week number one, right? fight the right battles against the right enemies. We waste so much time and energy, quite often, fighting the wrong battles against the wrong people, right? We fight the wrong enemy. For for example, you know, your um, the, the, the true enemy is the devil. Your true battles are in the spiritual world. It's not your neighbor who you can't get along with because their dog always leaves presents on your yard. That's not your true enemy. It's really a spiritual battle that there's tension between you and your neighbor, that either you don't have the, comf- the, the ability to w- talk through that type of issue, that, that maybe, maybe you are supposed to witness to your neighbor, but you're afraid, and it's spiritual oppression keeping you from having a difficult conversation. Just go share the gospel and know and love your neighbor, right? Sometimes we spend energy, and then we waste that energy fighting the wrong battles against the wrong people. Are you with me, family? Then last week we talked about, Brother David just knocked it out of the park talking about we can survive the struggle with greater ease if we surround ourselves with wise friends. Poor Job. Poor, poor Job. He's at rock bottom. And I don't know how many chapters there are of conversation between him and his friends. I think it's somewhere between 1 million and 10 million. There's so many chapters of his friends They just won't shut up. Well, I'll give them credit. They sat quietly for a little while, but then once they started, they should have maybe been quiet again. Their advice was so bad that when the Lord spoke, he rebuked Job's friends and said, listen, you guys, you better have Job pray for you. (laughs) That's what God said to Job's friends. At one point, one of Job's friends, remember, Job is at rock bottom, you guys remember Job's story? You remember everything that happened to him? Man, he knows struggle. At one point, he is the most wealthy and powerful and influential person in all the land. And there was this heavenly conversation that took place. And in this heavenly conversation, the devil is making these accusations against Job. And he's saying, hey, the only reason Job worships you, God, is because you blessed him so abundantly. And then God, for reasons that God never tells us, said, okay, you can take it all. And in one day, Job goes from having everything you could ever imagine to four messengers come in succession. They're almost interrupting each other because they're coming so rapidly. Job, all of your servants were killed by raiders. Job, everything was burnt up by fire from heaven. Job, your kids were having a party in their house together. And the roof fell down. It's great catastrophe and killed every. And it just they come and they in, interrupt each other. And it's horrible. And then Job's, one of Job's friends comes up to Job and says, hey, you know what? You should have got it worse. You are such a dirty, rotten, horrible sinner that actually, you're lucky this is as bad as you got it. You probably deserve worse. Surviving the struggle is often much easier when we surround ourselves with wise friends. 
wise friends. Today we're going to talk about surviving the struggle. By the way, let me, let me preface this. I want to kind of build you up a little bit. Um, I've been walking with the Lord for about 17 years. I've only really understood this lesson for the last one year. It took me 16 years with the Lord to really grasp the lesson I'm going to introduce to you today. I hope that you maybe already know this lesson or today that it changes your life like it changed mine. Today we're going to talk about surviving the struggles by realizing that sometimes your struggle is not a problem to solve. Sometimes your struggle is a tension to manage. Sometimes your struggle isn't a problem to solve. Sometimes your struggle is a tension to manage. This is kind of where Job's at. Job has a struggle the epitome of human suffering. You think about this. Job's struggle was so bad. His struggle was so bad that when he describes his wounds, he describes it as if there are maggots living in and devouring his flesh. And he scrapes his wounds. He's in agony from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head, basically just living in a dump and just in ash, covered with sores and being devoured by maggots. That's where Job's at. And what Job is realizing at the end of the story is that there's no problem he can solve here. He can't undo what was done. He has to survive the struggle by managing the tension. Amen, family? Is this kind of hitting home already a little bit? Some of these things are not problems you can solve. Some of them are tensions to manage, and let's, let's get into that by um, talking about a couple of those. Some of your struggles, right? Some of your struggles, some of you, some of you, it's a financial struggle, and it's a 10-year financial struggle, right? You're like, hey, I just want to be a good little Christian boy or girl and just not have debt and just do the whole financial peace thing, and you work so hard on it, and you work so hard on it, and then you got there, and then your car breaks down, and then you work so hard, and you get there again, and then medical bill comes. And you work so hard and you get there again and you're like me. If you look at your wife, she gets pregnant. And then there comes the hospital bill. And you know, whatever happens, it just keeps coming. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. It keeps coming. Maybe, maybe it's a parenting thing. Maybe you've got some kiddos and it's a parenting thing. And, and the struggle is, the struggle is no matter what you do, you just, you can't, you don't feel like you're the parent you want to be yet. You just, you just, you, you want to, but no matter what you do, you just don't feel like you're quite, you're just not quite where you want to be. I want more time with my kids. No matter what I do, I just don't have enough time with my kids. And maybe you just live with that struggle. Maybe it's not a parenting thing. Maybe it's not a marriage thing. Maybe it's, maybe it's the lack of a relationship. And it's that se- season of singleness. And you just live in that tension. I don't want to be single. God didn't make me to be single. Maybe he's calling me to be single, and I just have to deal with that tension. Maybe it's not a problem to solve. Maybe it's a tension to manage. Maybe like Job, it's a health issue. It's a debilitating disease. And the diagnosis is just yes. Yes, it's there. It's going to stay there. Yes. Maybe, maybe that's it. And maybe it's not a problem to solve. Maybe it's a tension to manage. See, sometimes our struggles, survival, is all we got. And, and sometimes the struggle becomes so much easier to, easier to survive. Sometimes there's so much more misery to avoid when you realize, I don't have to spend all of my time and energy trying to solve a problem I can't solve. But I can manage the tension while I wait for God to bring deliverance. Is this speaking to some people today? Let's look at what the Lord says to Job in chapter 40, verses 1 through 5. Please stand. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. This is the second time that the Lord spoke to Job. Job says, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. 
as you have your seats, you can, you can really boil down the whole conversation between God and Job by saying, God, God presents this, this, leading up to this. God, let me back up a little bit. God, leading up to this, speaks out. After God is tired of listening to Job's, some commentators call him Job's worthless friends with their bad advice, God finally steps in and speaks into the situation, and he, he doesn't answer the question the way we want him to answer it. See, the whole book of Job kind of leads you to ask this question. Why does God allow righteous people to suffer? And you, it, it leads you to kind of beg for an answer. Well, how is God good when bad things happen to quote-unquote good people? And when God speaks up, he answers pretty much everything but that question. Instead, he answers in this very surprising way. And what he does is he takes Job, in the, in the beginning of the conversation, chapter 38, you should read it. By the way, if you ha- it's really, by, Job is the hardest book in the Bible for me to read. It's the absolute hardest because there's, like I said, 10 million chapters of dialogue in the middle. And it's just so hard for me to read. Some people think Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are hard. I think Job's the hardest to read. But when you get to chapter 38, it just sucks you in. God speaks, and what God does is he takes Job on this spiritual virtual tour of the universe, and he even, he even humors us with some humorous sarcasm, and I love it. It's just the best when God gets sarcastic with Job. He, he, I'm paraphrasing because you've got to read it for yourself, but he essentially says, Job, Job, let me, let me tell you one more point before I tell you what God says. All throughout Job, the devil is accusing Job against to the Lord, saying he's going to curse you. And it looks like there's these little moments throughout Job where Job's about to curse God. When God speaks, he never holds Job guilty for accusing God. It looks like a couple moments like Job went up to the edge. He maybe t- tipped his toes right over the ledge. But he never got to the point where he cursed God. Really close. Not quite. And so God kind of has this humorous, sarcastic conversation with him. He says, Job, you got it all figured out, buddy, don't you? Well, since you guys are so smart and wise and you know how I should be being God better than I know how to be God, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Surely you know. You know how the earth was formed and, and you, you, you have the answer to When the command was made that the sea begins and ends here, you have that all figured out, don't you? Job, hey, buddy. You got that, right? Oh, Job, 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 Job. He he describes outer space. He says, you were the one who wrapped, wrapped the earth in darkness and then tells the light when to come and go, and you have the storehouses of lightning and hail. Like, you got that all figured out? Oh, oh, Job, hey, I know, I know, I know, I know. Since you have everything figured out, how did you hang the stars in the sky? And he goes on this cosmic tour, and it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. You really need to read it. And then he gets kind of more to a, more of a personal level. He goes through nature, and he says, hey, Job, did you design the horse to have the beautiful mane that adorns it? Did you, did you do that? Do you understand the artistic design behind a horse's beautiful flowing mane? You got that down? And he goes through and he explains creation to Job. And Job's response in verse 40, in chapter 40, is, this, is, is essentially a response to that. He's like, okay, God, you've humbled me. Okay, God, you've humbled. Okay, God, I, you're right. You're right. My, my, my struggle isn't a problem to solve. My struggle his attention to manage. God, I, I don't need, I don't understand why you did what you did. I don't understand why this is happening, but I can just manage the tension that, that you're God and I can trust you when I don't understand you. You could sum up the whole conversation between God and Job with those words. God never says those words. Don't be careful. This isn't what God said. He didn't say manage the tension, but you can sum up the entire book of Job with that phrase. Manage the tension and wait for God to deliver. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Is this going home with you, family? Amen? Here, here's, here's the thing. This next part that I'm going to share with you could be life-changing if you do the homework. 
See, see here, here's what I need you to do. It's so hard to get Christians to go and meditate on stuff. Like legitimately, take, take what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes and go home and lock yourself in a room and spend 30 minutes thinking about it. Go to the frying pan, put on some headphones. I promise you, people will leave you alone. Uh, you don't even have to have anything playing in the headphones. Just wear the headphones and just sit down and have a cup of coffee and just write, write a list of these things. Because some things are not problems to solve. Some things are just tensions to manage. And God is illustrating this in the most profound way with Job's situation. Just trust God while you manage the tension. Let me, let me give you an example. Here's why the homework's so important. Because sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between the two. Sometimes it's so hard to tell. Is this a problem to solve or is this a tension to manage? Problem to solve, tension to manage. Problem, problem, tension. Problem, tension, problem, tension. Here's some examples to help you understand the point. If you are um, feeling the, the tension that you want to spend more time with your kids... Parents, how many of you live in that tension? You just, you just want more time with your kids. And then how many of you, sometimes you need more breaks from your kids? And all the parents said, and all the kids, we love you. And all of the kids, we love you. And all of the kids, we love you. But the reality is, is if you're a neglectful parent, that's a problem to solve. If you are a parent who cannot get enough time with your kids, that's a good tension to live with. Because if the tension of having a desire to spend time with your kids goes away, guess what happens? You become a neglectful parent. It's good to live with the tension of wanting your kids. That makes you a good parent. Because you love your kids. You want more with them. How about this one? For all the dating people, young and old, I was given some dating advice before the 9 o'clock service to one of the teenagers in the lobby. And uh, it was really good dating advice. So I'll see if I can remember it. I said... Unless he loves you enough to fold your hands and pray, he doesn't get to hold your hand on any day. Dr. Seuss that up for the kids in the room. So that's my dating advice. That's my dating advice for you. But here's a tension, right? No, number one, problem to solve. Problem to solve, date somebody who respects you and loves your soul in a heavenly, godly way. Have standards so that you will not date somebody who does not love you in a Christ-like way. That's a problem to solve. The tension to manage is the burden of singleness when you have high standards. That's a tension to manage and a problem to solve. Here's another one. Uh, fundraising your building plan. That's a problem to solve and it's a big stressful one, but you guys are doing a great job. A tension to manage is having a healthy church budget year after year after year after year. Having a healthy budget is a good tension to live with, even in your household, right? Having a good budget, what's that do for you? It makes sure that you spend your money wisely. The moment that you don't have the tension of a healthy budget, you blow all of your money, or you don't appreciate what you have, and then you end up being the guy I started with my first illustration. You're just living in that constant battle between financial peace and lacking it, right? Right? Having the tension of how you manage your money is a good thing to live in, right? Finance people, am I right? Amen? Absolutely right. It's a tension to manage. Major wound or injury. Oh, gosh, my hand got cut off. Well, that's a problem to solve. Tension to manage. My wife used to suffer from something called Graves' disease. It's a horrible disease. Your thyroid becomes overactive, and for her, it manifested itself by her body was hot all the time. She just always warm. She could never cool down. And her, she, her skin was itchy all over her body constantly. Um, you and I, we, we use this much energy maintaining our emotional state. When you have Graves' disease, it's so hard to manage your emotions. You, just, you have to work three times as hard to have the same level of emotions as a normal person because you're just really high, really low, and just ready to flip out. Um, so many other things, tired, brain fog. She just told me, she, I just feel dumb all the time. Her brain wouldn't work the way it's supposed to. And for a season, that disease was a tension to manage. By the way, she was, we were told she would live with it forever. And so far, it looks like she's just been healed of it. And praise God for that. Just went away one day. For a season, though, it was a very difficult tension to manage. We could not solve the problem, but God did. So amen to that. What are, what are some more? Lacking a routine 
that hinders your life. If your life is just unstructured chaos and you can't manage healthy relationships or healthy boundaries and, and all these other things, you can't get to work on time, you can't keep a job, that's a problem to solve. Add some structure into your life. But attention to manage is if you think you want to accomplish something great, you, you're, you're going to be busy. That's attention to manage. Being busy is a tension to manage if you want to accomplish something. It's okay to have a 60-hour work week if you want to accomplish something great. Just manage your 60 hours and then the other hours outside of that well. It's okay. Amen, family? If you want to do something excellent, be busy. Be busy. Be busy. But manage the tension. Manage the tension. How about this one? Uh, so often, I, when I counsel couples in, in marriage and dating situations, the reality is, is we, we, want to, we want to figure out a way, like, we, are, we fight too much in our relationship. And the goal is, how do we get conflict out of the relationship? Stop it. Your relationship and your family is a complex organism with many people who are growing and changing year by year. You're going to have conflict. Conflict in the home is a tension to manage. The problem to solve is making sure you fight fair. The problem to solve is making sure you fight in a healthy way. The problem to solve is make sure that you handle conflict in a way that there's no punches below the belt. Okay? Fight fair. Have rules in how you manage conflict so you do it well. <laughs> Throw back to the peacemaker sermon. Are you, are you with me, family? Problem to solve versus tension to manage. One more. One more. That person who the Lord Almighty has etched onto your heart that you're supposed to go talk to about Jesus. That is a problem to solve. Just go, get off your butt, go knock on their door right now, leave, go get them, talk to them about Jesus while you're driving them here, okay? Just go talk to them about Jesus. It's a problem to solve. Talk to that person about Jesus. But the tension to manage burden on your heart for the lost souls in your community across the street and around the world without Jesus. That is a tension to manage, and I pray to God that he increases the tension in all of your lives. Because when that tension is removed from your life, if you could solve the problem and make that tension go away without reaching everybody, then guess what happens? Restore church stops being a witness. To the lost, hurt, and broken souls across the street around the world is a fully evangelistic, fully staple, fully disciple-making staple to the community, which is our vision statement. I pray to God that you have and you manage that tension. Here's Job's problem. Here's Job's struggle. He has lost absolutely everything. And no matter what he does, he can't undo what happened to him. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you, no matter what you do, you can't undo what happened. And if you could solve the problem, it would be solved by now. You've tried, you've tried, you've tried, you've tried. So maybe, maybe it's not a problem to solve. Maybe it's a tension to manage. And maybe... God can use that to be a game changer on everything you deal with in that struggle. Amen, family? Maybe it's a problem to solve. So how do we manage the tent? Here's, here's the thing. It's like, okay, pastor, yeah, yeah, easy for you to say. You're not in my struggle. How do I manage the tension? Let me give you three things that we see throughout the book of Job to help manage tension. And here's the first one. Remember I said when we started... Learn the lessons that from Job's experience that Job didn't have available to him yet. Do you remember when I said that? This first one, Job was not capable of this lesson because it doesn't look like he knew what was going on. But you do. So you're without excuse. Here's what you can do. Number one, assume the best of God and the worst of Satan. Manage the tension by assuming the best of God. Manage the tension by assuming the worst of Satan. Jesus says this in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What's so funny about that is how often Christians assume the best of Satan and the worst of God. Right? We assume the best of Satan and the worst of God. We're like, we're like, we just look for excuses sometimes. How can I blame God for all my problems? And then we look at the devil and we're like, 
And you know what? You're offering me some bad things that look like fun. Let's go hang out, bro. Let's do this. How easy is it to do that? We're like, hey, hey, God, yeah, you know what? You're the one who died for me. You're the one who's sustaining my cellular makeup. You guys ever look at cellular biology, how your cells are held together? It is incredible. God, you're the one who's holding me together at a cellular level. You're the one who sustains the universe. You're the one who died for me. But you know what? Screw you because I had a bad day. Satan, hey, guess what? You, want it, you literally want to rip me apart limb from limb? Let's go sin together. That sounds awesome. And then you flip God the bird and walk away and go party with the devil. Kind of dramatic, right? But incredibly realistic. You manage the tension by assuming the best of God and the worst of Satan. Because I love this, what Jesus said. He says, the devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And sometimes we're like, well, sometimes he wants that, but sometimes he's fun. And then Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The problem is sometimes we want a full life that's different than the type of fullness God wants from us. And God loves you too much to give you the type of full that you're seeking. He gives you the type of full that you need. Assume the best of God, the worst of Satan, manage the tension. And man, it just keeps going. He, Paul gives us the be, one of the best examples of that. 2 Corinthians 12, 17 through 10. He says, therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what that thorn was. But he says, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times, verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul nailed this mindset, right? He, he acknowledges all those things in one passage. He says, he says, God, I assume the best of God, and to keep me from being conceited, to protect me from my own pride, God did something. I assume the best of God, but then he says, I had a devil torment me. He doesn't blame God. He acknowledges that the devil is the source of torment. He assumes the worst of Satan, the best of God, and then he just ties it all together, right? He's, he's living, Romans 8, 28. God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Assume the best of God. Assume the worst of Satan. And so sometimes we're like, okay, what's going on here? And why, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? What if it's just both? Is God disciplining me? Well, maybe he is. He loves you too much not to discipline you. When, you're good, when your kid needs discipline, by golly, give them discipline. Amen, parents? And kids, by golly, sometimes we need a little discipline, don't we? I'll be honest, I needed a little more discipline than I got sometimes. Right? Is God disciplining? Well, maybe he is. Is the devil tempting me? He probably is. Is God trying to teach me a lesson? Okay, he probably is. Does it matter? Assume the best of God. Assume the worst of Satan. And this leads to the second tip. As I enter this second tip, what I want to do is I want to be really careful. I want to be really sensitive to your struggles. How, how many people have a significant struggle in your life right now? Well, could you could you do me a favor? Could you could you hold your hands really high and just look around the room? Can you can you guys feel that for each other? You're you're in good company. You're not alone. Did you did you did you maybe for a minute a minute ago did you maybe feel a little alone in your struggle? Anybody feel a little alone in your struggle? You, you look around and do you realize how not alone you are? All right, one more time. Everybody with a struggle, raise your hand. Look around. Look around. Make eye contact. Get goofy. You are absolutely not alone, right? You are not the only person in this room feeling the way you feel. You're in good company. You're in incredibly good company. So what I want to do is, is I want to I want to acknowledge the significant struggle represented in this room. I don't want to be insensitive about it. Okay, I'm not preaching this from some high horse saying la da 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 da. Just shake it off, walk away, be okay. Just I don't know, pray it away, snap your fingers. What did I say last week? Snap your fingers, wiggle your nose, shake your butt, and do a little dance. I don't know. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I don't want to mitigate your pain into something insignificant. I want to acknowledge the depth of some of your pain. But, but with that in mind, let me give you this second tip, okay? 
Sometimes it's easier to manage the tension by spending less time asking, why did this happen, and more time asking, where can God grow me? Spending more time asking, where can I grow? How much, how much does that change the struggle? How easy is it to just indulge in, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? I need to solve the problem. Solve the problem. Why is this happening? You can't solve the problem. It doesn't matter why it happened. Where can you grow? Where can you grow? Where can God grow you in this struggle? And James says this in James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. What happens? Manage the tension. In other words, endure and then grow. Or look at uh, Romans 5, 2 through 6. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Here it comes, verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God says this all throughout Scripture. Grow, endure, and grow, endure, and grow. Manage the tension and grow, endure, and grow. How can God grow me in this situation? It was, it was a few years ago, and I, I told you guys a couple weeks ago how hard writing is for me. It's just ironic that God called me to be a pastor because writing is so darn hard for me. I told you my brain's like a thousand airplanes landing and taking off simultaneously. I'm just a little crazy. And that's, that's, not, that's just how I feel all the time. And it was a couple years ago. And I, I just couldn't get anything done. I just, I just could, I just could not produce anything. I spent a week working on this. I spent another work week working on this. I fumbled through the first week, the second week. I just Saturday night came, and I, I'm sitting at the church. I'm sitting with my laptop. I just can't get anything out. I knew what I wanted to talk about. I, I was in the Word of God. I just, I just wanted to honor Jesus. All I wanted to do, all, all I wanted to do, I just wanted to glorify God, and I just wanted to love my church. And I sit in my laptop, and I just couldn't get anything out. Saturday night, now it's midnight, Sunday morning, and I just can't get anything done. I just can't. It's 2 a.m. I can't get anything done. It's 3 a.m. I can't get anything done. It's 5 a.m. I can't, I don't have a sermon done. And the church was much smaller and much weaker and much fra- more fragile than it was now. And, and like this could be the end of Restore Church. I couldn't get anything done. It's 5 a.m. And I go to sleep on the lobby, in, on the couch in the lobby. And I sleep from 5 to 6 without anything done. And then I woke up at 6 just because I was afraid that somebody would come in early and see me sleeping on the couch in the lobby. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I just, I just couldn't get it done. So I just, I just winged it. I, just, I literally just winged it the whole day. I just walked up and I just started talking about things I was passionate about from Scripture. And at the time, I just, I was just so zealous for God's holiness. I'll be really honest. I was not a very loving pastor in that time. I just wanted people to just stop sinning and just worship God because so much, so much of our sin is just so stupid, right? Anybody feel like that? Sometimes it's just so stupid. Why do I do these stupid things? Why do we make each other's and our own lives so difficult with such stupid sins? And I preached on it, and it was just hell and fire and brimstone. It did not come out in the way I wanted it to, and it was so bad. 
It was so bad that that same week, one guy who I thought, I, the church was really small. We didn't have very many leaders. And, and I just, I didn't have a sermon. I just went up there and I winged it. And then what happened was this guy, I was just, I thought he was going to like becoming a really good friend. And I'm like, I need guys like this to help take the church to the next level. And he just leaves. And he's just like, I'm done. Walks out of the service. He's like, I'm done with you. He didn't say it to me with his words. He said it with his actions. And he refused to talk to me for like two years. And then one of our other leaders wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> The next day, he left a resignation letter on my desk in my office. Refused to talk to me. And I felt like a failure. I put everything I had. And I just felt like a failure. I, 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 that, that week was the worst week of my life. Those months were the worst months of my life. It's the closest I've ever come to having suicidal ideations. I felt like a failure. I felt like this was the end of everything I dedicated my life to. I just couldn't get anything out. Like, oh, God, why? Why can't I do this? But instead of spending all of my time dwelling on why did this happen, I said, God, how can I grow from this? God, how can I grow from this? God, how can I grow from this? And that day, I made the choice. I, can, I, can I be really honest with you? That was the event that led to preaching at Restore getting good. Can I be really honest with you? That moment, because God wouldn't let me dwell on poor why me, why this happened, that moment was what made preaching at Restore good. I, 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 decide, I made a few decisions that day. I decided, number one, I do not need to live under the pressure of writing a best-selling author-level book for you guys every week. If our relationships are so shallow that everything we do is contingent upon the level of content I can produce for you, then, then we need to just close the doors because we don't have real relationships. We're just a little social club waiting for a performer to perform. I said, no, Restore Church will be a family gathering and not a show. And so I decided sometimes, strategically throughout the year, I'm going to rerun sermons for you, and I'm going to tell you about it. Because some sermons are so good, you should hear them ten times. You watch your same movie a hundred times and memorize the script, and a pastor has to live. Not, and some, some guys more than me. The pressure of writing a, a New York Times best-selling sermon for you every week? Are you kidding me? So I said, hey, we're going to do reruns in the schedule. We're going to do that. And then I made this other decision. I said, a couple times a year on purpose, I borrow content from other churches. And I tell you when I do it. Because guess what? I get better by learning how other good, great leaders think. I'm not going to live under that pressure. And I'm not going to make our team and our leaders live under that pressure. Guess what? That was the day preaching got good at Restore. Gave myself freedom to have guest speakers all the time. You think you need to hear me preach all the week? You need a break from me sometimes. Let's be honest. It's the best thing that ever happened to Restore. Instead of saying, why did this happen? What if we say, how can I grow? How can I grow? What's, what are you going through right now? How are you growing from it? What's God doing in it? What's God doing in it? Here's the last one. Acknowledge and practice. What are we going to do? We're going to assume the best to God. We're going to assume the worst to Satan. What are we going to do? We're going to spend a little more time saying, God, how can I grow? And then we're going to acknowledge and practice. We're going to acknowledge and practice. Hebrews 5, 12 through 14 says, For by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish between good and evil. How do you get good at distinguishing between good and evil? By practicing the tension of balance, figuring out which one's which. Right? What do we do? Manage the tension. Manage the tension. I brought some little show and tell today. These are resistance bands. They're way better than weights for those of you who are weightlifters. Now, I'll tell you, throwing up 
couple, couple two, three plates on a bench press feels way better than this flimsy little resistance band. But working the resistance is so much better. You see, what, 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 what it's so easy to, so the, you know how you get strong? Muscle under tension, right? Muscle under tension produces strength. You think about this. Muscle under tension produces strength. It's so easy when you're working out, even if you're a disciplined weightlifter, to let gravity do all the work for you, right? How many guys like to pump some iron once in a while? C come on, guys. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> Ladies, if, you're, if the man next to you likes to pump some iron once in a while, help him flex a little bit right now. <laughs> the reality is it's so easy to let gravity do the work for you. You, you, you do a rep and you load it up and you let the gravity pull it down. You lower it up. You're not, it, it's, really easy. It's, it's really easy to get show muscles, right? You just pump it as fast as you can, and you have big muscles for like 10 minutes. Those are just show muscles. Real muscle is built with tension over time. And even if you're a really good weightlifter, it's really easy with weights to go up, let gravity do the work. Even when you bench press, proper bench press, you go up to the top, you lock out your elbows. And, but what's, what the problem with that is, is you unload the tension from your muscles onto your skeletal system. You want to keep it from full extension. You want to keep the tension. That's why I love these babies, because they keep the tension the whole time. You have to manage the tension. Right here, this is about 25, 30 pounds of weight. As I go, we're at, at about 40 pounds right now. This is about a 55-pound dumbbells worth of weight right now. And you have to manage the tension. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to manage the tension. Don't, don't unload it at the end. Here's the thing. You got to acknowledge that you got tension. Do you understand what I'm saying? You got to, right now in your life, you got to acknowledge you got tension. See, a lot of times what we do is we say, hey, I'm managing the tension. But when we think we're managing the tension, you just let it go. You start managing. The problem is the tensions in your life have a bigger blast radius than my toes. It hits the people in your life. It hits your kids. It's your friends, it's your family when you don't manage the tension. You say you're managing the tension, you are actually putting yourself through psychological warfare because it's always sitting there waiting for you because you're always trying to solve it instead of managing it. You know what I'm saying? You're trying to lift it up and unload it somewhere. It's not meant to be unloaded. It's meant to be, say manage the tension. It's meant to be managed. So what do you do? You manage the tension. You manage it up. You manage it down. You manage the tension. See, here's what happens. Don't, by the way, don't touch me today. Um, but muscle built under tension versus you can get a pump, get big muscles, and they go away when the blood flow goes away. Muscle built under tension is hard all the time. You know what I'm saying? It's always strong. It's always ready to fire. It's always ready for maximum strength. So what happens to our souls? What happens to our relationship? What happens to our problems? when we actually manage the tension. See, sometimes, sometimes it's a problem to be solved. But a lot of times, it's a tension to be managed. See, some of us, we say we're managing the tension, but what we're actually doing is we're just distracting ourselves with TV, video games, I don't know, love, drugs, and rock and roll, right? And we're, we're distracting ourselves, and we're unloading tension that wasn't supposed to be unloaded, and we're supposed to manage it. Amen, family? I wonder, wh I wonder how that might change some of our struggles. So your struggles are so much easier to survive when you fight the right battles against the right enemies. Your battles are so much easier to, easier to survive when you surround yourself with wise friends. Your struggles are so much easier to survive when in godly ways you manage the tension instead of trying to solve every problem. What problem needs managed rather than solved? And sometimes the tension is good for you because tension builds strength over time. Endure, 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 endure. Produce hope, produce character, produce, produce, produce. Grow, grow, grow. How many are going to start managing the tension today? I got to preach harder. How many people are going to start managing the tension today? I'm going to preach a second sermon to you if you don't all get your hands up. <laughs> Two hands right there. Mike's got it figured out. I like Mike. I like Mike. Put your hands up. 
Father God, I pray. I pray that you don't let us be liars. God, don't let us be liars at church. (laughs) There's tension. Let's manage it. Because you're going to make us stronger through it. Some of us right now, we feel a tension, but the tension's actually something, something really interesting. It's the tension of you pulling us towards yourself and we're resisting it. God, I know there's someone here, I know there's someone watching online who they feel the tension, they're actually resisting your spirit. Your spirit's calling them to submission. Your spirit's calling them to surrender. Your spirit's calling them to, to love you. What the reality is, is they're making it harder because they're trying to manage the tension by themselves. Father, there's some things that are just uh, just too hard to do by ourselves, but when we invite somebody like you, a sovereign, all-powerful God who does things we don't understand, then we can manage the tension with you. You guys, I have this really huge resistance band up here. This is like... 250 pounds of tension when it's stretched out and I can't, I can't, I can bench it, but I can't curl it. But what happens when we have a little bit of help? We can take this thing all the way up and he's stronger than me, so he's got it better. But, uh, you guys, this isn't some health, help, self-help seminar telling you to get stronger by yourself. It's an invitation to have the Lord help you manage the tension. I really hope you do today. Everything's not a problem to be solved. Some of it's a tension to manage. So let's keep praying. Father God, those here among us who just needed that simple visual illustration to start letting you help with the tension, God, I pray that they just open their hearts to you. And they say, Jesus, I realize today I'm a sinner, but I'm I'm so grateful that you're a savior. I'm a sinner, but you're a savior, so save me. Help me manage the tension. Solve the problems. I'm, we're not saying don't solve the problems. Solve every problem that can be solved, but when there needs to be tension managed, help us to do that well, Father. Those that surrender to you right now, they can just cry out in their spirit. Right now as I pray, Father, I, may, I pray that they, they, just, they just let themselves go and say, God, I'm yours, you're mine. I'm made new in you. Your spirit is sealing me right now. I'm a child of God committed to the purposes and the will of God and and no force of evil can stop what you're doing in me now. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It just means you're going to help me manage the tension until the day that I enter paradise and be with you forever and the tension's all gone. Those of us who have immense struggles right now, may, may just this different way of thinking, which is a more biblical way of thinking, Help us survive the struggles with greater ease. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.